guys are talking. Brush two, 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 two guys. Two guys are talking. Brush two guys are talking. Brush two, two guys are guys are talking. Brush, 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 two guys. And now, get ready for the Two Guys Talking Rush podcast with your hosts, John Kane and Dan Buxman. Hi, folks. This is John Kane and the delightful Dan Buxman for another episode, show number eight of Two Guys Talking Rush. Dan, how are you, my friend? I got to say... Normally, I am the delightful Dan Bucks fan, but today I am the despondent Dan Bucks fan, Ooh. the dejected Dan Bucks fan, Ooh. and I will tell you why. Listeners, viewers, all of you out there in two guys talking rush land, uh, I must offer you a grievous apology uh, because last week there were some sound issues on my end uh, resulting from my wife being on a Zoom meeting in another room. My microphone picked it up. You could hear a little something in the background, you know, and this violates the spirit of this extremely high tech podcast that we're running. So I strenuously apologize for that experience. And I assure you going forward, it will never, ever, ever happen again. Just and I, perfection. It, I'm glad you brought it up, but it saddens me too. And now fans are going to be sending me hate mails because I just, I basically explained to folks that it was our, team of interns yes yeah. behind us a think tank of interns working to get the best future shows for yeah. us you know calling superstars getting information and tidbits on rush getting getty on the phone i mean they're yeah. all all of our interns are just trying to get getty on the phone but uh the genie's out of the bottle uh yeah it was well just... my uh my cute nickname for my wife is team of interns so, you know, like, like, hey, team of interns, you want to have dinner, hey, you know, that kind of thing. So technically, you know, you're still, you know, legally that would hold up in court. So we're okay. I'll do my best Ted Baxter yeah. voice like Dan Buxman and its team of interns. There you go. My, my, hall, go. Of yeah. my hall of Justice, uh, yeah. uh, Ted Knight. Uh, exactly. I, I love, Ted Knight was awesome, wasn't Ted he? Ted Knight was, dude, Judge Smales. Come Unbelievable. On. The, I mean, that's all you have to say is Judge Lou, yeah. Mer, Mer. Yeah. Well, I'm really dating myself. I'm like uh, oh, referencing we're both, Mary yeah. Tyler Moore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're both like... Hey, any chance I get to throw a beret up in the middle of a city square, yeah. I do it, dude. Like, I'm, Exactly. You, yeah, I mean, I got, got arrested for doing it a few times because big guy throwing beret in the middle of Times Square, you know? Naked big guy. Naked big guy. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, brutal. Well, anyway, uh, folks, that's our humor for today, and uh, we'll see. You, we'll see you next week. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Tip your waiter. <laughs> Tip your waiter, people. The okay. show has nothing to do with Rush. It's just both Dan and I, you know, trying to make each other laugh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, yes, show number eight, amazing, another milestone of a show. Each each week, we 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 ask ourselves, we ask each other, do you want to do this again? Um, but we but we decide to do it because we're now addicted to two guys talking rush yeah, I, I feel we, guilty for not serving the fans uh, this incredible platform of rush stuff. uh all kidding aside i am kind of addicted to doing this i really look forward to this all week uh when i'm doing like uh you know some of my other work and not always 100 percent uh enjoying it i do look forward to this and, uh, you know, especially now with everything that's going on, it really does kind of help me keep going and it's a, it's centers a me a little bit. Yeah, it's a good coping. Yeah, it uh, is. Mechanism. It is. Yeah. yeah, exactly. By the way, isn't there a song called Addicted to That Rush? Yes, there is. Who, who, who was that? Mr. Big. That's R Mr. Big, Addicted yes. to That Rush. Wow. Yes, exactly. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. More to, more to come on that one, folks. Well, anyway, um, this show is titled, cleverly titled, I try to think of these clever titles, and then I run them by Dan to see if they're, they don't sound stupid, which I don't know if they do or not, but sorry, folks. Two Guys Talking Rush podcast, episode eight, closer to the, closer to the art, Rush 
and the creative community. And today's show, we have a, uh, a musician named Jacob Moon. And uh, hopefully Jacob shows up. Uh, he's not getting paid, but uh, he, he sent me an email and he's, he's on board, I'm sure. But uh, his, his music's great. We'll get more into Jacob, who Jacob Moon is in a moment. But um, anyway, uh, Dan, I hope you had a, a splendid week, you and your mm-hmm. family. I hope our listeners had a good week and uh, you enjoyed last week's show, uh, which was uh, New World Fan, the expanding universe of Rush and popular culture. And our guest was Dr. Darrell Bauman, who yep. shared uh, some insightful information, some important research on the band. And, you know, I think Darrell's really digging deep with his philosophies and theories on how to make those connections with Rush and, the, and, and our world, the world we live in. Yeah, I really liked having someone on who is kind of like as deeply into it as we are and like has no problem uh, getting into the minutia and getting into like, you know, those tiny, tiny little details. I know. Uh, you, you know, we've been listening to this band for decades and, and we can still not only stay interested, but get excited about, you know, like these, these tiny little things about them. And there's so much there and there's so much to unpack that, you know, having having some guy on who wrote a dissertation about Rush. I, there are very few bands I can think of where that's called for and where that's appropriate. But in, in this case, I would say it is. Uh, I remember even joking that he had made like charts and graphs and all that sort of thing. And it's in, in this case, yes, it's appropriate. If you tried to do it for, I don't know, Wasp, I, I just don't, I don't know that, you know, you'd have as much success no shaming on wasp i you know i, I went into a youtube wormhole last week and it, it was a wasp wormhole. Oh, yeah. okay. uh, we always bring up other bands of the yeah. show but yeah, sorry, sorry folks we're you sorry. know we're metalhead uh, old school metalhead fans and it's all connected guys but yes, uh, anyway wasp you know there were some later albums that i forgot about that were actually pretty good the headless is the headless children album headless, i think so yeah okay yeah yeah well that was that's a very good record anyway onward um blackie lawless uh, they'll know, there's no one like Blackie Lawless for sure. Uh, who I'm no, sure is a Ru- yeah, and uh, he covered a Who song, which I'm sure he mm-hmm. loves Rush as well. So, you know, um, I w- I would think any like professional rock bass player would have some kind of you know some kind of connection to the music of Rush in some way. You know, just, I mean, even sure. if they're not you know 100 percent into it like you and I are, I just I have to imagine they'd hear something on the radio and just like, Oh, Oh, that's interesting. You know, I mean, just as, as a musician. And on that note, I'm a wild child. Um, (laughs) I love that song. Anyway, uh, we'll be having more shows under the guise of the new world fan series, the expanding universe of Russian popular culture. We'll be exploring other avenues uh, on that topic and uh, some more interesting guests, of course. Uh, you can hear our podcast on TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Simplecast, and many others. Uh, we want to give a, a, a rushradio.org shout out for uh, providing some uh, wonderful uh, tunes each day on the rushradio.org uh, uh, website and um, the, within the TuneIn app. Uh, Rush Radio is great. Uh, shout out to Why Why Not for their music, uh, which can be heard in the intro. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, we love those guys and we will have them on the show shortly. Um, also, we want to hear from fans, you know, questions from fans, uh, you know, uh, in, insight, uh, suggestions. Tell us how much you love us. Tell us how much you think we suck. I mean, it's okay. If, we, if you don't like us, guys, I mean, I've never done anything to you. I'm pro- we're providing a free thing here for you. Yeah. But, hey, you might just not like my voice or, yeah. you know, my hat. Or my voice. <laughs> right. Or my hair. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. But uh, chances are you have something to say and don't hold back. Uh, definitely shoot us an email at two guys talking rush at gmail.com. And it's funny when you look at the, the actual URL name or the, the email, it looks like two guys stalking rush, but we are yes. not stalking rush. We're not stalking them at we're, all. We're yeah. not, well, no. maybe we are a little bit. I mean, through the, the interwebs here, but uh, it's kind of funny. I have uh, to, to I have a court order that I have to stay at least 500 feet away from Alex Lifeson's house. 
I heard so, that. Yeah, I heard I ki- that. I kid, I kid. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, the, the second we released uh, the name of the show and the URL, I had jokes coming at me within like yeah. 30 seconds yeah, yeah. that we well, were stalking them. Regarding uh, stalking Alex Lyson, didn't you like rip your pants on his outside wall, climbing the wall outside of his house? Wasn't that an issue? That that is, you or somebody else? That is a spurious lie uh, that is uh, put out there by people in an attempt to uh, defame me. Middle-aged Rush fan middle-aged, splits yeah, pants. Fat middle-aged Rush fan <laughs> splits, splits pants, pants in Toronto. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I yeah. love it. That's so yeah, good. Exactly. Yeah. Damn, where are you going to get humor like this on a podcast? You're anyway, not. You're not. You're not. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, we're always looking for super fans. Uh, we're trying to line the show up with super fans. If you think you're a Rush super fan, if you've been to 300 concerts, if you have more patches than the next guy, Rush patches, if you have tattoos all over your face, your feet, your groin, all Rush related, yeah. we want to learn about you. So what makes you a super fan? Join us. You can call in. You can join the Zoom uh, chat. However you want to engage Send us an email. Tell us why you're a super fan. Send us a photo, and uh, maybe we'll send you a sticker. I think at, at some point we're going to get some stickers. We are going to get it together with merch. Yeah, uh, you know, some as, mugs, mugs, some mugs. Yeah, I'd like a nice two guys talking rush mug. I think hats, mugs, shirts, stickers. That's like well, it's four things. I was going to say it's the holy trinity, but yeah, it's whatever is one after a trinity of merch. That's what people usually tend to want. Yes. Uh, I've done things in the past where I tried to do like wacky, unusual merch and that stuff just sits there. Uh, People don't want that at all. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Definitely merch uh, is in the, uh, in the future. Uh, So you can uh, also visit us on our website at www.twoguystalkingrush.com. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all the social media outlets. Mm -hmm. We're up to date folks. We're cutting edge with all the technology uh, and uh, it's there for you to uh, to access. Anyway, yeah, we're, not, um, we're not two middle aged men trying desperately to you know stay caught up with technology that no. we barely understand. No, it yeah. just took it just took took me five hours just to log on today, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I I love to talk about Rush news. You know, there seems to be always something in the uh, in the world uh, that's Rush related. Um, uh, as of late, Getty Lee pens epilogue for new book. Forever Terry, A Legacy in Letters, the new book, Forever Terry, colon, A Legacy in Letters, releases uh, or was released last week. It includes an epilogue written by uh, Rush's Getty Lee. The book celebrates the legacy of Terry Fox and the 40th anniversary of his Marathon of Hope. It includes 40 letters from 40 celebrated Canadians paying tribute to Terry's legacy. Um, Terry, Terrence Stanley Fox was a Canadian athlete, humanitarian, and re- cancer research activist in 1980 with one leg having been amputated due to cancer. He embarked embarked on an east to west cross Canada run to raise money and awareness for cancer research. Wow. And yeah, pretty cool. And uh, hey, speaking of Alex Lyson, 67 years old. That's this, right. This week. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Happy birthday, uh, Alex. We love you, man. Absolutely. One thing also, um, I we keep missing this, yeah. but um, there have been a few shows that we've done that have been within like a day or two of a specific album release. Yeah. And yesterday uh, was the 29th anniversary of the release of Roll the Bones. So that is noteworthy oh. and uh, worth bringing Do you like up. that album, Dan? Um, of, of their stuff in that period, I, I like it a little better. Um, I cannot with the title track. I cannot do it. Um, but when I listen to the rest of the album without that, it's not bad. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, again, I'm, I'm on record here numerous times as saying, you know, that like, uh, you know, Hold Your Fire, Presto, Roll the Bones, like this not not my favorite period of the band. But, you know, again, the songwriting is always there. The musicianship is always there. Yeah, yeah. Every, t- you know, no matter what. And, uh, you know, when when Neil passed, I decided, you know, maybe I should spend a little more time with these albums that I've kind yeah. of written off a little bit. And I listened back to all of them. I was, I was like, these are a lot better than I remember. Yeah. Um, I think part of the problem was that uh, Roll the Bones came out when I was like just deep, deep, deep in metal. Yeah. You know, like 100 percent. And, uh, you know, I just I just wasn't interested in, you know, anything that was maybe a little more smooth or sophisticated or whatever. 
Um, and I just kind of took that mindset with me for many years. But now, you know, you know, now that I'm older and I revisited, I feel like there's a lot there. But I would need to give it a few more listens before I could really say anything authoritative about it. Uh, yeah. The instrumental is very good. Yep. Um, the leave big that, wheel. Leave that, leave that thing alone, right? Is that? Uh, yeah, I yeah, think so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the big wheel, I think, is good. That's uh, excellent. Dreamline. Dreamline. Yes. Yeah. Uh, bravado is on that right or am i bravado might that? be on that one yeah we should okay, just yeah. pull it up but uh yeah, yeah I dream, dreamline yeah. dreamline and roll the bones i think were the two standards on there i mean in rotation uh intermittent songs that they would pull from that album i yeah. mean they were from many tours where i'd see them and they would always pull out roll the bones uh but dreamline seems to be on a lot of live albums it's yeah. such a magnificent song and uh it was a good I, opener it was a very good great, set opener like great. that was exactly the uh, yeah when i saw yeah. them on uh counterparts they opened yeah. with that the production on that album for me is crisp i mean there's just yeah. it's very crispy and i love roll the bones a lot i mean what i, I always i say this what do, what don't you like by rush but um i i too was listening to metal when that album came out and i still there was a, a level of forgiveness i had for rush uh with with that even if the music was a little soft, softer than your average, you know, headbanger, and right. they weren't of that caliber, but I, I would forgive Rush in a way where it was, it was like almost pulling out a classical record, you know, of classical music. It just right. held its own little area uh, of specialty. Like you, you know, you'd go out for fine dining, you know, uh, the rest was kind of crap, but you'd yeah. always always could rely on rush for a level of quality and things like that but yeah i've heard Let's, people say that roll of bones is not the fit come on you know jack relax i get busy with no you don't like that well one thing you have to keep in mind also is that at the same time it was released more or less give or take a few weeks um metallica's black album came out right and Nevermind by nirvana came out so that yep. that's the background that that was released sure. against sure. and when you look at it it's like wow they're they're making no attempt whatsoever to like be like hey guys you know this grunge thing is getting big we'd better we better do something yeah, yeah. um you know I, there are maybe a few people who said that about counterparts like right. that they were getting a little bit more aggressive to yeah. compete but i didn't really think they were i don't i to, you know to me they were always just kind of on their own yeah island and yeah. uh you know and it just didn't really matter what else was going on musically yeah and yeah. you know um i'm not a fan but you know never mind was a revolutionary album that you know changed a lot of people's music listening habits it was, it was the catalyst for the grunge movement i mean yes, it, was it was the yeah, yeah very much yeah and uh you know the black album by metallica also was this huge sea uh, change for a lot yeah. of people i mean I, I loved metallica and then when that album came out i was just like oh yeah, huge fail i didn't like the, the the simplicity of it you could tell things were changing not to get into other types of music but there are these these you know these bands that kind of put out a continuum of quality and then it cha it abruptly changes yeah. and uh you know I, I i wonder if there is one rush album that you could identify with that was like, oh that's different you know that's hmm, maybe i don't maybe you know because of this this slow shift into keyboards from subdivisions on um or yes i would have to say from subdivision excuse not subdivisions uh, signals. Uh, signals on uh that um that there was a ease they eased people into the key. But before you know it, you're immersed in uh, keyboard heavy music, you know, with Rush, but. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, anyway. I, I remember like when those other albums came out, there was very much this like, whoa, they just completely turned a corner. Yeah, yeah. You know, especially with Metallica, but you know, yeah. with Rush, that was every album. Right. Every right. album was different from the last one. And right. Even, you know, there may have been consistent, you know, things running running through a few albums sequentially yeah. or something like that. Yeah. But for the most part, I mean, you, there really aren't two albums that I'm like, oh yeah, this is just more of what they were doing before. They never did yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. cool. Well, moving on. Uh, this I, and I always like to. Oh, well, there was there was another little tidbit of rush, random rush stuff. You know, for whatever it's worth. But Dra Brown Trout Publishers has released their official. 2021 rush wall calendar which celebrates the upcoming 40th anniversary of the february 1981 release of rush moving pictures album uh, seriously this is, oh yes God. it's wow. an official 16 month calendar that includes a four month september through december 2020 planner page so get yours 
today, folks. Um, this week in Rush history, 1976, Rush plays the Hara Arena in Dayton, Ohio on the All the Worlds of Stage Tour. In 1982, they play Brown County Arena in Green Bay, Wisconsin on the Signal Store. Oh, I wish I'd saw, seen that tour. Uh, in 82, they play the Lacrosse Center in Lacrosse, Wisconsin on the Signal Store. 1990, Chronicles was released. I forgot about Chronicles, and I, you know, I was look. I'm, I'm trying to update my Rush album collection. Mm -hmm. Chronicles is one that's hard to find. Um, I have it on CD, but uh, yeah, I forgot. I was like, oh yeah, Chronicles. A, uh, that's a pretty good comp. I got to say, it's very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Uh, in '94, Alex Lifeson per performed on "All Along the Watchtower" at the second Kambaya Fest Festival, a benefit concert in Toronto to raise money for AIDS hospices across Canada. Later released as Kumbaya 95. 2001, quote, prison song by metal band System of a Down was released on Toxicity. The closing notes are the final notes of the Temples of Syrinx. 1991, Roll the Bones was released. There it is. 2010, Rush played the PNC Bank Arts Center in Holmdale, New Jersey on the Time Machine Tour 2014. Um... Five Across on today's New York Times crossword was 2013 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees. 2010, Rush played the Allentown Fair in Allentown, Pennsylvania on the Time Machine Tour. Rush, also Rush Icon was released in North America, a low-budget compilation featuring tracks from 74 to 87. Well, uh, this weekend is a special weekend for those who celebrate it. If you don't, then hit your little fast forward on your, uh, on your iPhones. But it's Labor Day weekend in the United mm -hmm. States. What does Labor, May, Labor Day mean to you or, or to me or to the average human that works, that is a, is, is a laborer of some sorts, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, Labor Day is the first Monday in September. Uh, in September, it's a creation of the labor movement. It is dedicated to the social and economic achievements of the American workers. It constitutes a yearly national tribute to the contribution contributions of workers have made to the strength, prosperity, and well-being of the United States. Why do I bring that up? Well, what song can we relate to Labor Day? Hmm. I have to think about this. No, obviously. But may I give it away? Or Go ahead, it? Dan. Okay. Working man. Exactly. Right. The song, yes. Well, yes, uh, that's, that was you, the one. Yeah, well, okay, I can't good. think yeah. of any other. Yeah. Uh, but it's Labor Day, and, and, and the song "Working Man" is is the song, right? Uh, yeah. Well, just one more, one last little tidbit. Um, the first Labor Day holiday was celebrated on Tuesday, September fifth, eighteen eighty two, in New York City, in accordance with the plans of the Central Labor Union. The Central Labor Union held its second Labor Day holiday just a year later, on September fifth, eighteen eighty three. By eighteen eighty ninety four, twenty three more states had adopted the holiday, and on June twenty eighth. 1894, President Grover Cleveland signed a law making the first Monday in September of each year a national holiday. The official song of Labor Day is Working Man exactly. on Two Guys Talking Rush. Yes. And so, interestingly, yes. if, it, uh, if Grover Cleveland was the one who, you know, sort of put it through, then, you know, his namesake city, Cleveland, was where uh, Donna Halper was working as a DJ and heard the song working man yes which you know busted the whole thing open so you know many you know many many components dan this is why yeah. you're on the show man this is it right there yeah. and that's a, that's an excellent connection Thank and you. uh you know there's continuity and everything and yeah. uh everything we try to do here on two guys talking rush is meaningful we try yes. to give you meaningful content folks don't get into a car accident while you're listening. Don't do pull that. over. Yeah. If, yeah. Yeah, if you're that immersed yeah. in what we're telling you, pull over, take a breather, listen to us, and we'll, we'll give you everything you need within an hour, hour's time. Um, why don't we just hear a little bit of Working Man uh, quickly here?
when you listen to that song, mm -hmm. just the riff. And there's nothing. It's a blue collar tune. It's the I mean, riff. Yeah. It's the riff, yeah, is, man. I mean, yeah. it's so blue collar. You know, if you were to yeah. evoke, you know, a song about a working man or a working woman, someone just just beating it down every day, trying to make a living. Wow, that's pre Neil Peart. You know, I mean, wow, that's still as monumental of a song as anything they've ever written. Yeah, I notice also like a little bit in Getty's voice, there's a little bit of like, um, I almost want to say like maybe like Southern blues inflection, yeah. just the tiniest little bit of it. I, and you know, he pretty much dropped that after this album, but right. it just goes to show you how much they really were like, we are like a hard rock straight ahead, you know, rock band. Um, which they then <laughs> completely abandoned and went on to the next thing. Totally. But you know, when we had uh, Martin Popoff, when I when we had Martin Popoff on, I was saying like they could have continued in that vein like for a few albums and had, you know had a very nice career for themselves. They were good at that. I really thought they that's a good album. Uh, you know, it just it gets short shrift sometimes because Neil's not on it. Right. Uh, but I think John Rutsey turns in a fine performance, and it's it's a good record. You know. It just gets overlooked. You know. It does get overlooked. It does. But it's a wonderful record. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Working Man, song by our band Rush uh, from the al self-titled album Rush, uh, released March 1974 and uh, recorded in 73. Um, labels uh, Moon, which is a very collectible album, if you can find it on the Moon label, Anthem Mercury. And uh, Working Man is a song uh, on the self-titled debut album. The song's guitar solo was voted 94th in the in guitar world magazine's list of 100 100 greatest guitar solos in an interview on rolling stone uh bassist and lead singer voc vocalist getty lee said that working man is his favorite song to play live and then we're going back to our very first guest and very good friend of mine and ours donna helper then a disc jockey and music director at wmms in cleveland ohio is credited with getting rush notice in the united states by playing working man yep. on the air the song proved particularly popular in the working class city. The response resulted in a record deal for the band, which gave her special thanks for her part in their early history and dedicated their first two albums to her. Wow. What a legacy. Yeah. Hey, I ha we had to do it. It's Labor Day weekend. It's two guys talking rush. You know, many of you folks out there are going to do whatever you're doing to pay the bills, to support your families, to support yourself. You know, it's Friday, come home, take your shoes off, get in the pool, drink a beer, do whatever you do, but you're relaxing from that hard week, you know? Working, I want to add, I add yeah. also, um, you know, all the people because of COVID who are not working uh, through no fault of their that's own, just, right. just because that's what's going on right now. Uh, I know that this is a really hard time for you. And I know that all of you would much rather be working than sitting around waiting and wondering what's going to happen but we see you we recognize you and this song applies to you too just because there's a global pandemic <laughs> that's completely beyond your control and that doesn't mean you're not working people and we hope that this blows over soon and we all get back to regular life thanks for mentioning that so true yeah. and um we're going to have future shows uh which is again part of our series called behind the lighted stage on people working in the production world yeah. those who've worked uh, with rush in the production world and uh we're going to do more shows dedicated and bringing light to that uh to the serious issue of the uh entertainment industry and how it's uh um, being literally crushed right now i mean yeah. i see so many venues around me that we love that are getting hit so hard man there was one in uh, boston that just closed right there was oh that there's was like a few a no, but I mean, this, this week specifically. Yeah, the poorhouse in right. Boston. And, yeah. um, you know, I heard uh, a few others. Yeah, it's terrible. Well, yeah. um, you know, folks, thank you for, for, for joining us again. We appreciate all of our listeners. Uh, and again, we try to have the best guests on as much as possible. You know, interesting guests. Um, they don't need to be fancy. They just need to have some story or some Rush-related uh, story. And uh, well, again, this is episode eight, Closer to the Art, Rush and the Creative Community. Uh, I like to think that this, this series of episodes deals with people who have been inspired by Rush uh, to create music. Uh, maybe Rush has inspired someone to write a book. Um, 
to uh, to pick up an instrument uh, and so on. And our next guest is uh, recording artist Jacob Moon. Jacob is a solo Canadian folk singer songwriter and the guitarist. Uh, is based in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. He has an extensive repertoire of songs with nine albums to his credit. He's won many accolades and has been invited to perform for and with some of his heroes, including Rush, Marillion, Ron Sexsmith, and Gordon Lightfoot. Yep. Moon's famous YouTube cover of Rush Subdivisions went viral in 2009 and has earned him many fans around the world. Um, we're very excited to have yes. uh, Jacob on the show. And I, I just want to play a quick clip of his subdivisions because I, I think it's very good uh, and maybe another if we have time. So... very good it's great yeah um i don't even know what to say but <laughs> you know because I'm, I'm just not used to hearing it that way uh he plays it great and he sounds great um but again it's you know just wow my god you know <laughs> I'm, I'm used to hearing that song one way you know it's so true and um hearing rush uh being interpreted uh in uh in other presentations of music yeah. is really interesting i um i had a, a rush classical cd it was just all classical uh, performers uh instrumentalists playing various rush it was very good i mean interpret it interprets well uh here's yeah. an here's another it's red sector a by jacob And I have to say that um, that Rush covers by uh, it's Red Sector A, of course. Uh, for all of you who know, uh, it's um, by Jacob Moon and Adi Burke on piano, and mm -hmm. uh, beautiful rendition. And Great. again, yeah. different. Totally. Um, yeah, I love that song so much. Yeah. Well, folks, let's uh, let's bring on Jacob Moon. We want to welcome our guests uh, onto Two Guys Talking Rush. Jacob. Yes. Hi. Hey, hey. What's happening? Uh, Jacob, this is Dan Buxman, co-host. 
How you doing? Nice to meet hey. you. Hey guys, I'm just uh, setting up my uh, audio settings here. Just gonna be two shakes. Cool. Uh, I think it's oh, it's remembered them the ones I wanted. That's great. We're set. This awesome, dude. Thank you for. Uh, looks like you're gonna play a little music for us. I think that's really special. I sorry to land that on you last minute, but I'm thinking like, why didn't I ask you that to begin with? You know, uh, but that's oh, great. It's no worries. No worries. I even brought you guys some cereal, some some nutritional cereal. Oh, delicious. Ooh. Ooh. This is sugar rush with that with some with that free kimono inside there. So I think you. Is this is this like a purely Canadian thing, or could uh, people from the United States, like us, find that yeah, no, on uh, supermarket shelves? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's uh, it, it's very high in fiber. It says contains prog ingredients. Ah, okay. used in this product may contain traces of yes, the who, and Jeffro Tall. <laughs> Delicious, glorious. Yeah. I could pull back a box of that, no problem. Yeah, <laughs> no, easily. <laughs> Yeah, we were just Jacob. We, thank you for being on the show. Um, yeah. This is this is our eighth episode, and um, we're you know we on this particular show. We you know other Rush podcasts examine lyrics and kind of get into the micro of Rush as any you know geeky Rush fan would do. You know we want to uncover the the new stuff, right? But here we're, we're, with these shows, we're trying to uncover how Rush has made an impact on society, uh, on culture, on politics, and various things. And this show examines how Rush uh, might have influenced someone to pick up a guitar, to play a song, to write a book, just, you know, inspiring someone to be something beyond what they feel maybe their initial capabilities are, you know? So mm -hmm. we were just listening to, and I hope you, I'm sure you I hope you don't mind. We were just listening to your rendition of Subdivisions and your rendition of Red Sector A. Uh, and I, I, Subdivisions was something that you did on, on, the, on a whim. I mean, how did you plan on, did yeah. you know it would go viral? I mean, how did, that kind of set it off for you, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. No, I mean, I, I was always a Rush fan. I mean, I discovered later that I wasn't as big of a Rush fan as Rush fans are. <laughs> because there's always someone out there who's going to be who's going to geek out harder than you you know of yes um and so i i would hang out in basements and kind of you know try and you know decode these record sleeves and, the, and all of the you know all of the imagery and all of the 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 lyrical imagery that came up in the songs and um it was all just catnip to a you know adolescent male you know uh uh, especially within striking distance of, of where the band came from themselves. You know, it all just felt personal almost. It's like, like it yeah. didn't belong to us. And so, um, yeah, and that was kind of the story for a long time. And I was just a fan, like, you know, like, like you are. And I think it was, was before, you know, everybody had access to celebrities and you could just kind of, you know, uh, get them to record your outgoing voice message or whatever for 50 bucks or something. Um, and then people were a lot more like sort of scarce. And so yeah, Rush for me were, were these far off people that were just kind of almost, you know, this, this, this rock trinity that, uh, that existed in, in myth more than in reality. And um, so when I got to actually see them perform live in, uh, when was it? 2007 or something like that. Uh, I forget when it was. Maybe 2005. It was the um, snakes and arrows. It was the R30 tour. R30. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So whatever, whatever year that was. Looks like 04 ish. Was it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it might have been the hangover from that because they they played Toronto, and uh, they played subdivisions that night, and I was in the front row. I just got tickets from my brother-in-law who knew the band, and I didn't I didn't know them. He just knew them because they came to his restaurant all the time. And um, they said, oh, yeah, give, give me a couple of free tickets. And we'll, we'll shuck oysters for you backstage. Nice. And so I didn't help with that at all. I just kind of sat in the front front row and watched the music. And I was blown away by uh, maybe for the first time, you know, for by the by the songs. And I thought, well, if it's a great song, you should be able to go home and just kind of pick up your acoustic guitar and play it. Right. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of like making your own spray. <laughs> Technically, it's lemon and lime, but there's more to it. And so uh, it took me a while to kind of pull together the uh, arrangement. But uh, about a year and a half later, I went up on a rooftop. I recorded on a whim, you know, pretty much. It happened very quickly. Over the course of a week, I just talked to some fellow filmmaker, independent filmmaker guys and said, let's go on a roof. Let's just, you know, uh, try it and see what happens. We got, we got to basically play it three times before the 
before the sun went down because it took a long time to set up. But uh, but that's what you saw was kind of the last take was me playing just as the sun is kind of going down and um, put it up on YouTube. Um, I think it went up on YouTube on December 24th. 2008. 2008. Almost 11 years which was ago. Not a, not a good time to put up a YouTube video. <laughs> No one's going to pay attention to it. But somehow a week later, I, I sort of checked it and it had thousands of views already. And I was like, whoa, this is kind of in the YouTube's infancy. And so yeah. that was like, that was considered going viral, you know what I mean? And um, and then tens of thousands of views. And then Rush kind of reached out and said, hey, like, uh, it was Getty Lee actually that sent an email through my sister-in-law, uh, through my sister, um, whose, brother, whose, uh, whose husband runs the restaurant and said, hey, just let him know the guys have all seen it. We love it. We think he's awesome. Keep up the good work. I was like, that's it. I can die now, you know? <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then basically from there, it was just uh, uh, a waiting game to see what would happen next. I kind of played a bunch of shows and time went by. And finally, about 10 months later, their, their management called me, um, which, you know, I just assumed was them calling to sue me, you know, for using this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they, they, uh, they wanted to know whether I was willing to come and perform uh, subdivisions live uh, at their induction into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame, uh, which was, yeah, it was wild to me. Um, That's incredible. So, um, yeah, so I, I was, of course, I said yes, um, and then kind of was like, oh man, what did I just say yes to? Uh, and uh, of course, it, it was yes from my perspective and from Russia's perspective, but it really wasn't their call, it wasn't their show somebody else was kind of celebrating them through the Canadian songwriters hall of fame. So I had yeah. to almost be vetted to get on the show. Yeah. So I played the press conference for the announcement of the show. And that was kind of a check on to see whether I was going to actually play the show. And yeah. it went well, they, they had me on, um, never forget it. Very unforgettable night getting to meet the band that night. And, um, I mean, first I played and then after afterwards I got to meet them. Um, but, uh, that was probably, yeah, I mean, it's probably the mountaintop experience for an independent singer-songwriter to kind of be playing for his heroes, yeah. you know, in front of the hoi polloi of the Canadian music industry yeah. uh, with, you know, his heroes up in the orchestra box, standing at the, like, I, funny story, I, I, I basically was super nervous about this show. As you can imagine, I'm pacing the boards backstage, trying to figure out how am I going to get all this gear? Because if you've seen the video, Right, you guys have seen oh, the yeah. video. Oh, yeah. The um, I'm, I've got a lot of stuff. I got this guitar. I got like another guitar right. on a stand. I got looping pedals. I got a little, little voice recorder. Little recorder, right? So I got <laughs> I got a lot of gear, right? So I'm yeah. just like, how do I get all that all out? Are they gonna close the curtain and then I can set it up? And they're like, no, they're not closing the curtain. I'm like, oh. So then, how do I do this? And I said, well, just grab every roadie that you can and give them a piece of gear. And so we had about 10 roadies march all this stuff out onto That's the stage. Funny. And within three minutes, it was plugged in, I think, and ready to go. And it's like, and here's Jacob Boone. And I'm oh. like, uh, do I have a signal? You know what I mean? I'm Whoa. Launch into it. And then that's when I left my body. You know, that's when yeah. I kind of just exited, you know, right. and, and watched from above as I played this song for Getty, Alex, and Neil. Yeah. And uh, it was just this moment that just. I'm I see. I see your your memoir, your future memoir, Jacob Moon, from rooftop to rush. Yeah, I like that. Nice. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. But, no, that's a big part. That's a big part of my story. And and then yeah. I mean, just to play that song in front of them was just a thrill. I didn't. I don't think I ever caught their eye or looked at them. The lights were kind of blinding. But as I was playing the final flourish of the song, I look up and uh, everyone is on their feet. And I just got like chills from head to toe so and just finished a big smile on my face and just floated off the stage. You know what I mean? And, and uh, afterwards got to kind of connect with them. I remember Alex writing, I love you on my hand, on my hand and, and so Sharpie cool. and uh, Getty Lee kind of, you know, circumspect, but polite, you know, and, and kind of quiet. And then Neil usually doesn't say anything. He just gets on a motorcycle, as you guys know, right. and rides away. And, um, he came across the room and came and talked to me and said, Hey, yeah. um, thank you so much for covering subdivisions that way. Because as the lyricist, I always heard the music that way as kind of more of a folk yeah. uh, yeah. songwriter presentation, yeah. but yeah. we're rushed. So we do everything kind of big and, 
and bold and so uh that's what you do so beautifully is you just strip it down man you know and uh it it makes it into something else but still has an essence of rush yeah and i don't know if that's because you're canadian or whatever man yeah. i don't know i don't know if anybody else could pull that off but there's still it still retains that rush yeah. to it you know that yeah. level of quality you know that rush and standard that rush is always it's not just you're not just grabbing a guitar and hacking away at a song at all yeah there's the composition still an underlying composition is still there it's tasteful uh and it's pleasant to hear and even your approach with red sector a it's like wow i never even imagined that song to be played like that you know and it just works man you know but there's there's more to you besides rush so tell us about who you are as a musician and uh you know what you've done in your in your in your career with regards to music and what you're you know you don't want i'm wondering did you ever imagine yourself to be known as someone who covered Rush or were you setting out on a journey to become? No, listen, man, I just, you know, the goal as an independent musician is just to be known. Right. Period. Yeah. And I always get this question from like, you know, young singer songwriters are always like worried about the wrong things. They're always like, Hey, uh, where do I go to copyright my songs? I want to make sure nobody steals my song. I'm like, that's not the problem. Right. Nobody's nobody's heard your songs. Obscurity is your worst enemy. And so, for me, I'm just like, that's not how I intended to, you know, get noticed. But just from reading articles and interviews by my own kind of songwriting heroes, their trajectory is never planned. It's always kind of something that happens. They stumble into notoriety and they just stumble into uh, their accolades. And, and this is kind of something that came out of something that they love to do. That's what I would say. Like I could, I guess I could sort of in a calculated way sit here and, you know, cover Ed Sheeran, Beyonce and Billie Eilish songs and get millions of views. But I, what I follow is the passion, right? Is the love is what do I really love? And if that puts me in kind of like a, a camp with, with, um, you know, with a certain demographic um, that I didn't plan to be singing for, that's fine. That's great. I mean, I just want to play for people. I don't care. I'm not picky about who the people are. I just want to play for an audience. And so I think when I first set out, I thought it would be great to be signed to a major label. I think I would be great to tour internationally and do all that stuff. But truthfully, I wasn't really ready for it. This music thing, it takes a lot of practice. (laughs) It takes a lot of, uh, you know, repetitive failure and then picking yourself up, dusting yourself off and going back at it. And um, I had the pleasure and the, you know, uh, privilege of getting to do that in relative obscurity. So it's always good to make your mistakes in relative obscurity. Yeah. (laughs) Rather than like on TMZ.com or something, you know, so... uh, uh, yeah. What, so, what, uh, what do Rush fans say to you? Do Rush fans come to you? What, what are the, what's the, some of the most common things Rush fans will say to you regarding your work or just in general? Yeah, I mean, I've I've actually been really blown away. I think I thought initially because I wasn't I didn't feel part of the Rush fan community when I covered this song. I felt kind of quite outside it. I was worried that maybe they were kind of like Star Trek fans and they were kind of purists. <laughs> and I think there is a certain sort of collection of them that are like that. And they really just want to hear the original masters of those songs. And that's enough for them to the end of time kind of thing. And I've always been a little more promiscuous in my, in my musical, uh, you know, listening uh, habits. And so I am not satisfied with that as a listener. And so therefore when I go to arrange a song, I'm, I'm always kind of messing with it a bit. And so I get comments of people who are really, appreciative of what I what I've done for for the songs that they know and love giving them another reason to listen to them and another way to hear those lyrics to uncover to almost like unearth you know an arche- in an archaeological dig sort of style uh, the lyrics and the meaning and the and the, uh, the, the real poignancy and, and resonance of Neil's lyrics you know yeah. songs like time stand still or uh, beautiful. Delay or, or subdivisions those are kind of yeah, those those are the ones where I feel like I, I kind of dug up the, the words a bit. Yeah. You're sort of isolating this kind of like very pure distillation of what these songs are all about. You know, you're extracting from it like just like the very bare materials that have yes. to be there. And they it still to. comes across. I mean, I I have to say, like, to me, you have humongous balls to go out there and try to cover these guys at all, whether you're trying to do it faithfully or take it somewhere else or whatever. 
And I, I think with music like this, what I found is people either go like note for note cover band, you know, uh, the, the goal is to make it as close to the original as possible. Or you have to do what you're doing and just take it completely in this other direction. Um, for me personally, I don't really see the point in the cover band approach. I want to see, you know, what else can we do with this? What, what is this all about? And, uh, you know, I think what you were saying, like about the poignancy of these songs and that sort of thing, um, it's, that's always come out to me when I've listened to Rush. But the way you're doing it, it's, it's really shining more of a spotlight on that sort of thing. That was never, you know, when you listen to the original uh, subdivisions, that all comes out, that all comes through. But to focus solely on that, I think is a really interesting idea. And I think it's something a lot of Rush fans wouldn't necessarily think of first. And I mean, apparently the guys liked it enough to where you now appear on a Rush album. So, you know, so I guess you did the right thing. I've heard, I've heard nothing but good things about you. uh, And, you know, from, from the Rush elites, yeah. You know, from the up, upper echelon of, of Rush leaders uh, that are kind of peripheral leaders around the band, you know, Donna Halper, Dr. Bauman, you know. Uh, so I think you've you've been officially adopted into the yeah. Rush family, dude. You're um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is, there, is, there, is there an era of Rush that you like to cover the most or, or like the most? Because well, there's many. Know, so, yeah. I mean, I was born, so I'm coming up on my 50th birthday. And so nice. I was born in 1970. And so when I was old enough to really get what Rush was doing, it was kind of, I was maybe 12 or 13 or something. So that anything that was around that zone, you know, you know, and I think of moving pictures, I think of Exit Stage Left as being kind of seminal records for me. And then anything they did after that was interesting too. Um, you know, Hold Your Fire and, and uh, Roll the Bones and Test for Echo and all that stuff. It was, it was, was stuff that I really dug as well. And, um, and then I kind of fell off during the nineties and sort of beyond there was kind of, uh, I I would check in on what they were doing. I would kind of listen out of one ear and I would kind of realize that they were going in a certain direction that maybe I couldn't follow them in necessarily. Um, but when they kind of had their victory lap year, you know, or two, um, and they started kind of pulling in some other things when they're doing stuff like, uh, summertime blues and you know doing these covers and kind of sh- almost jamming a little bit you know I mean, that was really refreshing to me to know that they still did that that they didn't just kind of um you know write their parts and then separately come into the studio and work with that dude and record them and then go out on tour like i knew they were friends but like you wanted to hear it in the music i mean i was i'm always attracted i mean if i can hear the fact that the band is having a good time mm-hmm. yeah um, then I'm, I'm really happy to listen to that music and it's cool was, calculated but it's just kind of coming out of a pure place you know whether that's a film or whether that's music or whether it's art it's it's always really you can tell kind of thing and and sometimes that's you know I was just listening to somebody talk about filmmakers the other day and how you were always excited by new filmmakers uh, by their first couple of movies because those are their, their most pure raw expressions of who they are and their raw id and and um and they're still kind of in love with the art form and how it can express those ideas. And musically, I think that's true as well. You can kind of hear people's early work and kind of, uh, I think with Rush's earliest work, you know, that you can hear all the pieces, all the building blocks are there, but the refinement that Neil brought and the refinement that, that Getty started to add to his voice and allowing himself to sing in other registers um, that's when I started to really kind of pay attention that, okay, they were, they, they built something really cool and then also kind of refining it to this, this, uh, you know, this thing that stayed with them through the years, all their live shows are incredible. You know? Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And, um, but, but different fans will have different favorite records, you know, that's just kind of the way it is. Yeah. Well, I think you're on the same page with them, you know, the, in, uh, the behind the lighted stage documentary, um, Neil calls moving pictures, you know, he, uh, think what he said is it's the album where we became us mm. and that and it's like their eighth record or so, you know, it's way down the line to suddenly become you you know uh no but i mean that you know that says a lot about the music industry at the time where you actually you were actually allowed to develop slowly over a number of years and, and you know and then really get to this to this point um i know you don't have that uh you don't have that luxury today because uh, the you know the recording industry is completely different now the music industry is completely different and you have to build yourself up in a different way 
uh, at, at this exact moment, it's basically impossible. But, you know, I, I played music a long time ago. And when I stopped and started looking at how the industry was, I was like, wow, this is turning into like this really fast uh, and brutal business that I don't think I could survive in. And that's, you know, the music industry has always been considered this kind of fast and brutal business. But, uh, you know, after the late 90s, when a lot of the labels collapsed and it turned more and more into this like very corporate thing, it just seemed to me like really you have to be independent and go your own way. And if you're sincere and what you're doing is not contrived, you maybe stand a better chance of, you know, sort of poking out and people noticing you than if you go in this other direction, that's kind of more playing by the rules. And it's, I mean, it seems to me like that's what's happened with you was you decided like, that's not really for me. I'm gonna go this other way because that's what excites me. And it just kind of happened. Uh, I think you said you stumbled into it maybe. Um, but that, you know, that's a sincere way of it happening. And uh, I think audiences can hear that. And I think people respond to that. Uh, the suits, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if they've respond to it as well. Yeah, yeah. Just, well, just, I, I, can't, I can't reach people through suits anyways. I, I basically right, just yes. through, through the social media and through playing live shows, or I did until 2020. So. I know, right. I know. Yeah. Hey, uh, Jake, well, little, I mean, how is, the, how is it in Canada right now? Like, you're, you're the, they're still not opening venues, are they? Or? No, the venues are not opening, but people are starting to do backyard concerts right. and kind of like deck concerts yeah. and stuff. And people are still pretty paranoid about social distancing sure. and everything else. And so I don't see that going away for at least another year, yeah. which is yeah. crazy, but no. it also is just kind of what it is. I mean, right now, the thing to do and the thing that I'm doing is to really focus your efforts on online, building an online business. Big time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. whether you're running a, a you know a trinket shop or a, or you're a musician, you got to have a strong online online game in order to uh, survive this period of um, the lockdown. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yep. So uh, yeah, because it's just it, it, people are kind of being very careful about how they spend their money. I'm sure. So, yeah. um, but they're also incredibly generous in my experience. I do a live stream every day. Cool. My house every weekday at noon called Moon at Noon. And uh, sometimes I do Moon at Nine, like I'll be doing one tonight. Um, and I've done Rush, I've done Genesis, I've done Marillion, you know, all these Ray La Montaigne, Ray La Montaigne. Yeah, Ray La yeah. I love Ray. I love Ray, man. Oh, it's good stuff. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Love it yeah, yeah. I just did Crowded House last night and cool. uh, I'll be doing like, you know, Mark Cohn and Sean Colvin and stuff tonight. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of. I'm, I'm done. I do my own stuff as well, but that's kind of how I'm reaching fans right now. It's very interpersonally and very strategically on Facebook, using Facebook ads to try to gather more people into that environment. So. And so where can people find out more about what you do? Yeah. I mean, uh, you can look at me on uh, facebook.com slash Jacob moon music. Um, and that's where all my live streams are. And that's where all kind of the latest stuff goes. And there's also my website, Jacob moon.com. And, um, yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's, those are two kind of main ways to reach me. And, and if you're interested in sort of becoming part of the team that kind of helps me to kind of get these songs and videos off the ground, I've got a website called patreon.com slash Jacob Moon. And uh, that's where you can kind of find. Good. Um, well, it looks like you have a beautiful guitar in your hands. What kind of, what kind of guitar is that, Jacob? Do you play? This, yeah. Guys, is a Furch. It's a, uh, you know, a Stonebridge, yes. mostly. Yeah. Now well, they changed it over to Furch, which I think is the last name of the dude who makes them. Nice. So, um, yeah. Would you, like, would you like to play us a song? Oh, yeah, sure. What do you oh. guys want to hear? Any, any requests? Anything you want to hear? Well, uh, I really liked your version of Something for Nothing. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, now, that to just play that on the acoustic guitar is a little tricky. Um, How about Time Stand Still? Time Stand Still. Yeah, absolutely, okay. guys. Absolutely. <laughs> Dan, Dan's going to take the uh, Amy Mann uh, background yeah, vocals right. for you. But... <laughs> Love it. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to uh, is, is take your time. Is that the famous uh, dad gad tuning uh, that this Jimmy Page used? No, this, this is my famous uh, uh, subdivisions tuning. Oh, this is your own. 
Yeah, it's got, well, not my own, but it's like, I'm sure other people could find it, but uh, there's only a few letters in the musical alphabet, but, um, but it's, uh, it, it's, it is what it is. It's, it's cool. It's, um, I know people who insist they invented certain tunings. So. Yeah, the advantage for me, honestly, is that it gives me a way to play more strings uh, open. And uh, the guitar is kind of like a harp in the sense that the more notes you can kind of play open, the better it sounds. I would like to say that this is the first live performance we've yes. had ever on Two Guys yeah. Talking Rush. Of course, we've only had eight, eight episodes. Yeah, but, but, you, <laughs> but yeah. you know, well, this, the podcast is doing great, but this is uh, wonderful to have Jacob uh, kind of uh, launch it's a us. value add, that. as they said. <laughs> it yeah. is. Yeah, man. Absolutely. I'm we happy to do that for you guys. Yes. Now, uh, I'll just put this sneak up. Put my... Um, audio source kind of up a little higher here just so that I can kind of catch the voice. There Perfect. we go. Uh, all right, so uh, yeah, let's give this one a whirl. Uh, all right. Turn my back to the Catch my breath before I start off again. Driven on without a moment to spend. To catch an evening with a drink and a friend. I let my skin get too thin. I'd like to pause, no matter what I pretend. Like some pilgrim, first to transcend. Just to live as if each step was the end. I'm not looking back, but I want to look around me now. So I know the people and the places that surround me now. Raise this moment. Sensation a little bit stronger. Experience steps away. Experience steps away. Time stands still. Turn my face to the sun. Catch my eye. My defense is down. All those wounds that I can't get unwound. I let my past go too fast. No time to pause. If I just slow it all down. Like some captain, the ship runs aground. I can wait until the tide comes around. Not looking back, but I want to look around me now. Some more of the people and the places that surround me now. Raise this moment a little bit longer. Make each sensation a little bit stronger. Make each impression a little bit stronger. Freeze this motion a little bit longer. The innocent steps away. The innocent steps away. Time stands still. Time stands still. people 
and the places that surround me now. Tribe stands still. Summer's going fast, night's growing colder. Children growing up, old friends growing older. Freeze this moment a little bit longer. Make each sensation a little bit stronger. Steps away. Experience steps away. The innocent steps away. Time stands still. Woo! Awesome, man. Yeah, very, very nice. nicely done. I swear, I mean, I love that song so much. And what a what a more fitting song to to play as we as the summer kind of comes to an end yeah. and, we, and we reflect, right? You, you're talking about turning fifty. I'm turning fifty soon. Dan, did you already turn fifty? How old are you now? Uh, next month, I turn fifty-one. Oh wow! So it's like reflection, you know? It's like we start to look back in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, I swear that that song would, by more Rush fans, would love that song if the video wasn't as you know with getty flying around like in that 80s time. <laughs> like I, if they didn't have that video you know uh but i i love that song i love that album so yeah, my first the problem, show <laughs> the problem with being on the cutting bleeding edge of uh, technology is that eventually you're gonna look dated you know? it's so true yeah. man it's so true um would you play one more song for us? But I wanted to hide a couple of questions before you do that. So, and if you could play, I don't know if you could, can you, can you pull off subdivisions or is that too much uh, to do oh, with? Oh, yeah, that's okay. All right. Um, what in, in, in with subdivisions and I see a younger you here uh, on this rooftop, very youthful. You're still very youthful, but you know, we would go back 10 years. We're looking younger and younger and younger. What sort of kid were you, let's say in high school subdivisions is this very high school kind of fast times at Ridgemont high uh, kind of vibe, you know, the, the eighties high school culture, you know, uh, trying to fit in, not really fitting in. No one fits in. Uh, and then, of course, being a Rush fan then, boy, you, you might not even have revealed that uh, uh, in a lot of ways to your, to your friends. But what, what sort of kid were you in high school? Were, were you playing music then? Or Yeah, so to give you a little picture of that, I, yeah. I, um, my first um, introduction to the musical world was, uh, of my high school was uh, joining a um, uh, sort of a, a lip-syncing contest uh, where, it, where it was kind of like... Um, yeah, you had to sort of pretend you were uh, an artist playing a, a hit song. So I was Brian Adams doing It's Only Love with my uh, friend Roxanne, who looked a lot like Tina Turner. And uh, <laughs> we went through the motions and we brought the house down and we won the, the top prize. And um, it was uh, pretty wild. I got 50 bucks to go to Sam the Record Man and buy whatever record I wanted. I probably bought a Rush record. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that was kind of how I got started was kind of by faking it. And I think probably fake it till you make it is, is, is maybe a, a, good one. a good way to sum it up. In fact, it's yeah. just kind of, <laughs> I joined a band called the Joshua Three and we uh, decided that U2 was, uh, you know, that, that, that they didn't need four people to play that music. Yeah. Whoever was singing lead should also play the bass, you know. So that was me, and so, so we did. We we uh, we had this little trio playing Rush music in in high school, um, and then basically I kind of was with the musical guys, but I was got a bit of a wannabe. I wasn't exactly as good as them or as cool as them. I was um, I was kind of in between all of the social groups. So I wasn't a nerd, but I could totally hang out with the tech guys and and talk with them and joke around with them and connect with them. And then I was on the student council and um, I wasn't in any athletics. Um, I, was, I got kicked out of class for drawing pictures of my art teacher. Uh, you know, nothing crazy, just, just comical pictures, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. teachers to make fun of her. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was kind of a bit of a, I don't know. Jokester. I wasn't a badass. I was yeah. just a bit, I was kind of like, but I was kind of like, 
I, don't, I didn't know what I wanted to be. And it took two years after high school to figure out that mm -hmm. I wanted to do music. Yeah. I didn't go right into university right after high school. Amazing. So I Amazing. was kind of, yeah, I was kind of lost, actually. So. I'm, I'm always curious about uh, Canadian culture. And, you know, of course, because of Rush, there's a lot of questions that sometimes go unanswered. But were Rush huge in Canada in high school at that time? I mean, were they uh, the dominant band as if Led Zeppelin might have been in, in the U.S. or something? Was Rush, like, part of the conversation a lot or were they still kind of a cultish band in Canada at that point? Yeah, I think I think for guys who are two years older than me, they were a big band for, for that group. But in my, it kept going into my age group for sure. But I think yeah. if you were just a couple years older than me, yeah, that's when it was really rocking. Because I think for my tenure of high school, which lasted from 84 to 89, yeah, that kind of just missed the zenith of Rush's uh, yeah. popularity. Interesting, interesting. Well, thank you for sharing that. I was curious about that. Yeah. You'll play subdivisions for us now? Yeah, that would be yeah, beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. This is great. Sprawling on the fringes of a city in geometrical insulated border in between the bright lights and the far under unknown growing up it all seems so excited opinions are provided the future is pre-decided detached and subdivided in Mass production zone. Nowhere is the dreamer or the misfit so long. In the high school halls, in the shopping malls, conform or be cast out. Subdivisions. In the basement bars. In the backs of cars, be cool, be cast out. Any escape might help to smooth the unattractive truth that the suburbs have no charms to smooth the restless dreams of you. To the city, the timeless old attraction, cruising for the action, lit up like a firefly, just to feel the living night. Some will sell their dreams for small desires, a lose from a race to rats, caught in. Traps or start to dream of somewhere to relax their restless vibe. Somewhere out in memory, lighted streets on a quiet night. In the high school halls, in the shopping malls. Conform or be cast out of division in the basement bars, in the backs of cars, be cool, or be cast out, be cool, or be cast out. Escape might help to smooth the unattractive truth that the suburbs have no charms to soothe the restless dreams of you.
That was very awesome, nice. Too. I think yeah. I like that version better than the one that's that's on YouTube. It seems like you've really come into it. You know, you know it yeah. now. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, totally, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that's, I mean, the YouTube, is, it's, a, it's an artifact of another time. I thought that's about amazing. a new version of it. You should, man. Um, you totally yeah, should. Kind of Might as well. Yeah. Redux. Yeah. 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 And I could call you in, call, call you up and be like, subdivisions, and then we can hang up the phone. <laughs> I, it's funny, yeah. that, that song is my ringtone. And, you know, whenever my, my phone rings, it, it goes on. And my, my four-year-old, who's going on five, she loves the song subdivision she's like play subdivision oh, yeah. play subdivision i don't think she understands the scope of the the magnificence of rush yet but uh you know no. she, she knows getty spaghetti you know we call him getty spaghetti um that's my, so cool. my my 13 year old rush has been a hard sell really and this yeah. guy he's, he's not into it at all he, yeah. i mean he listens to like uh taylor swift and lizzo you know and stuff like this so i mean it's yeah. really not for him yeah. but uh that's, what, that's why you kicked him out right he's still pretty trying. much yeah yeah, yeah, yeah that's why he's homeless <laughs> and you know stands on the corner with a cup <laughs> <laughs> unbelievable well um thank you for being on our show i have a couple more questions for you and i ask most of our guests this if you can't answer them just say pass but what are your top five rush albums mm. if i was to say pick t- a top five for you yeah yeah, I mean, probably number one would be Moving Pictures, and then uh, from there it would probably go um, uh, Exit Stage Left, um, and then uh, which I know live albums shouldn't count, but it does for me. Sure, it's a special record. Oh, those are great live. Um, yeah, yeah, and then uh, it would probably be uh, Grace Under Pressure. Yes, and um, then it would be um, Farewell to Kings, and then it would probably be just to kind of capture something from something later. Um, yeah, like uh, roll the bones, you know? Like that. Yeah. Cool, cool. Where, again, where can uh, folks find out more about what you do and what you uh, are up to? JacobMoon.com is a good place to start. And then uh, if you're on Facebook, you can find me there just by typing my name. And um, any of the socials really, just type in Jacob Moon and you'll see uh, my ugly mug staring back at you and we can uh, continue the conversation. <laughs> yeah. Jacob, what an honor and a pleasure it was to have you on the show, man. It really yeah. was very special. Thanks yeah. for asking, guys. I appreciate yeah. it. This is yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's so awesome. And uh, hopefully we can come see you live someday. And, um, uh, you know, I, I'm pr- fairly connected in the entertainment world. If I could help you uh, secure a gig somewhere or put, make a connection for you, just reach out to me sometime. You know, I'm on the, on the um, East Coast here of uh, the United States, in New Hampshire. Wow. And um, we, thank yeah, man, totally, dude. Yeah. And um, thank you so much, man. Yes. Thank you. My pleasure. It's such a right. good, so great to meet you guys. Thank you. Right on, man. Yep. Right. Stay strong, dude. Take you care. Too. Cheers. Peace. Wow, that was very special. No, it's funny. It's just, you don't you don't expect to hear the songs interpreted that way, right? Because um, I mean, we're just so used to them the way they are, and um, you know, like thirty five years, forty years, that kind of you know, you're that's this one way, and you know, he just broke it wide open. So you know, I mean, when the cliche is that uh, if you've written a good song, it doesn't matter what the arrangement is, it doesn't matter what, you know how you do it. It's like if you can bang it out like four notes on a piano and it sounds good you've got a good song so i think the fact that his approach works as well as it does is a real testament to how well written those songs are you know that you can approach them in that way yeah and um you know i asked him this question or i didn't really ask him this question i mentioned it to him that he he feels different his music feels his interpretations feel different i should say because right. it feels like he means it because he's yes. really a rush fan it's yes. not just it's not, not a karaoke act no. it's not a lounge act it's not a gimmick he right. really loves rush and he's taken it to a whole other level mm-hmm. and although I, think, yeah. I must say yeah. lounge versions of rush songs i would be interested to hear <laughs> any lounge singers out there that yeah, uh, yeah, there's a yeah. rush lounge band we yeah, yeah. we want you yeah star wars star nothing wars. but star wars <laughs> um yeah bill murray if you're out there and you want yeah. to do yeah totally wait bill's bill's a canadian right i don't know i don't know i have to look that up whoops yeah. um we love bill murray though uh so um what a, what a great opportunity. What a great honor to have Jacob Moon on the show. Uh, folks, enjoy your Labor Day. Enjoy being a working man and a working woman. There's nobility in that. 
Um, if you're out of work, please stay strong. Uh, the COVID thing uh, will soon pass and uh, support your local uh, 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 venues and uh, crew people uh, who are tortured by this uh, disastrous yeah. mess that the live and industry is in. Even Jacob said it. He's got to. You got to keep the stuff alive online. And I got to say, without without COVID nineteen, there would be no two guys talking rush. That's right. Yep. Th That's look, correct. It's yeah. so true, dude. Right. I mean, look what was born what's, what's out of funny, a pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's funny is like when there was no pandemic, there was nothing stopping us from doing this. We could have done it if we it's wanted so to, true. but. It, I don't know. So sometimes getting pushed into situations makes you, you know, a little bit more resourceful with what you have, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but it, you know, I mean, I, I know I say it over and over again, but this, this has been a great thing. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry it took a pandemic to make it happen. But, well, you know. think of what could happen, you know, when the pandemic is over, we could start a podcast about pandemics. Yes, exactly. This uh, week on our favorite pandemic, we're going to do the Spanish flu. For example, the bubonic plague and yeah, so I, on. Yeah, I can see on. that being very popular. Definitely. Two guys talking pandemics. Two guys talking plagues. Definitely. Two guys yeah. talking plagues. I like yeah. it. There you Two go. GDP. Well, folks, that is another episode of Two Guys Talking Rush. My name is in John Kane. It's in the books. Yeah. Show number eight. This means we're 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 legitimate. We mm -hmm. well maybe not so legitimate, but we are. We're serious, kind of, about this stuff, and we, we love you. We love Rush. We love Rush fans, um, and we want to try our hardest to bring you the best in quality content. Yes. And, uh, yep. I mean, even though I'm in, in the basement of my mother's house, and Dan is since divorced and can't find a roommate, it's all right. Yes. <laughs> we're, we're here for you. This is our sacrifice to you. Anyway, my name is John Kane. I am the delightful Dan Bucks fan. And thank you for tuning in to Two Guys Talking Rush. What can I say, folks? Rush rules. Ah, it really is your ringtone. I was in both of you. Yeah. Um, let's see who this is. Hold on one second. Hello? Congratulations. Your telephone number has been pre-selected by Ritz-Carlton Hotel to receive a complimentary stay in Mexico. For further details, press 1 now. Hello, this is Mason. How are you doing today? I'm pretty good. You're on a Rush podcast right now. What's your name? My name is Pakir. All right, Pakir. say hello. Pakir, say hello to everybody in Rushland. I don't think, I don't think his name was Pakir. <laughs> I don't think that's what he said. What did he say? I couldn't even hear. I couldn't hear. Uh, he said, he said my say? name is fuck you. <laughs>
at www.livenationentertainment.com slash crewnation.